Good morning. Let's go one more time. Good morning. Good morning. A real good Reno welcome. Good morning. Did everybody just say good morning? Good morning. All right. So while you're finding your seats, I ask that you please be courteous to our guest speakers and those around you by turning your cell phones, Blackberries, and other noise-making devices to the quiet mode. Please also minimize movement into and out of the room during this morning. Thank you. change is understanding diversity and how to strategically capitalize on the strength of our soldiers, airmen, and civilians. We come from across the 54 states, territories, and the District of Columbia. You represent a rich culture of people, attitudes, ethnicities, beliefs, and individual characteristics that are woven together in what we call the National Guard. Our vision is to create an organizational culture where diversity is valued as critical to personal readiness and mission success. In doing so, we ensure each individual has the opportunity and means to reach their maximum potential. that video. <laughs> to you again, I say good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2012 National Guard Diversity Conference being held in the great city of Reno, Nevada. And I am Colonel Barry, your advisor to the Chief of the National Guard Bureau on issues of diversity, leadership, and equal opportunity. I will be your master of ceremonies for this entire conference. That was a golf clap, thank you. <laughs> and at this time, I want to go over just a few administrative announcements. First, keep this in mind, safety is first. If it becomes necessary to evacuate the building, everyone will move calmly to the marked exits and assemble in the parking lot outside the hotel. Restrooms are located between the Bistro Napa and Treasurer's A. As you leave the ballroom, take a right, and they are on your left. The conference staff is here to assist you. They can be identified by the white polo shirts with the diversity conference logo on them. Security personnel are in their duty uniforms, ACUs with the MP, MP, uh, MP insignia patch on their left shoulder. Remember, security is everyone's business. If you see something, say something by either contacting the command center or security personnel patrolling the conference area. The conference command center is located in Treasurer's A. The phone number, if you want to take this down, is 775-954-4385. Remember, you're in Reno. You might want to write this down. 775 
954-4385. There is also a cyber cafe with laptop computers and a printer for use by any conference attendee. It's also located in Treasurer's A. Hours of operation are posted in the cafe. An IT specialist will be located in the room in the event that you should need some assistance. Regarding the agenda, please be sure to check the electronic bulletin board, which is outside, for any changes. It's located right outside this ballroom area. For question and answers during the sessions, there are microphones that have been strategically located in the aisles. Please move to the microphone if we have time for questions and answers today. Lastly, there is an informal icebreaker this evening at 1830 hours in the Paradise Terrace, cash bar with light snacks. Dress is casual. An informal speaking program will begin around 1900 hours. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Nevada National Guard Honor Guard and the singing of the national anthem by Captain Melissa Bochamp and the rendering of the invocation by Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel Tim Gregory. Honor Guard, present the colors. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the Good morning. Please join me in a word of prayer. Living God, you are the creator and sustainer of our very lives. And through our differences, you are magnified. 
as our conference begins, remind us that you have ordained a time such as this and that you have given us the privilege and responsibility of leadership. We ask that you would constantly infuse us with the courage to pursue greatness through diversity. Let us be known as a people who are passionate about creating a culture that is respectful of the diverse heritage and background of those we serve and lead. Gracious God, help us to be unyielding in our opposition to hatred, violence, and exclusiveness. Grant us steadfastness that we may be relentless in advocating the ideals of inclusion. When our tasks become burdensome and weary, refresh our inner being. Use our conference not only to transform our leadership, but also to transform the very essence of our lives, that we may not only impact our nation, but also eternity. Renew our vision for your justice. Help us to embody your spirit of goodness, that we may be witnesses and instruments of your peace. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Captain Beauchamp, Chaplain Gregory, and the Nevada National Guard Honor Guard. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. So at this time, I would like to recognize some of our distinguished guests. With us this morning, we have several adjutant generals. Would you all please stand and be recognized? Let's give them a big hand as the adjutant generals stand and be recognized. Big hand. I think I picked up on, was there somebody sitting over here? Okay. <laughs> he wanted to sit among his people. All right. Also, we have the Deputy Director of the Army National Guard, Major General Tim Cadavy. <laughs> the National Guard Bureau Comptroller and Director, Administration and Management from this state, Mr. Lou Carrera. He's from here, y'all. Y'all, give him a big hand. Give him a big hand. He's from here. 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 You know, every once in a while, your children leave home. So he came back home today. Command Chief Warrant Officer for the Army National Guard, Command Chief Warrant Officer Gary Nisker. The senior leader to the Chief of the National Guard Bureau. Chief Master Sergeant Denise Jelinski Hall. <laughs> Command Chief Master Sergeant to the Director of the Air National Guard. Command Chief Master Sergeant Chris Muncy. Big hand. <laughs> and Command Sergeant Major for the Army National Guard. Command Sergeant Major Richard Birch. Let's give our leaders a big, big hand, because without them, this is not possible. Without them, this is not possible. You, you know, it's a sacrifice to be here. There's so much going on right now. For them to take their time to be here among us, to learn more about greatness through diversity, we really appreciate that. So at this time, to kind of get our conference started, I just want to talk a little bit about the conference objectives. First of all, we call this greatness through diversity. One of the things I always want people to understand is there's greatness in everybody in this room, but in every soldier, airman, and civilian, there's greatness in them. And the push on the flywheel that we're gonna ask you to embrace over these next two days is what will it take for you to get better? What will it take for you to go to another level? What will it take when we leave here? This has not been a waste of our time. There has got to be a phenomenal return on investment. You see four things up there. The first thing is mindset. Say that with me, mindset. mindset. I want you to get that. Here's a question I want to ask. How many visions ago was your diversity strategy put in place? I really want you to think about that. Because when there's no vision, what happens? The people perish. 
the strategy falters. The organization doesn't go forward. So we want to change belief systems. We want to push paradigms. We want to make you more aware of being unaware. The next one is heart set. Say heart set with me. This is a heart issue. If you don't have a fundamental care for people, if you don't have a belief for the ones that we represent each and every day, this will be very tough for us. You have to have a genuine love for diversity. And diversity is in all parts of our lives. Search your hearts while you are here and ask yourself constantly, where must I be better? Because if we're not getting better, if we're not growing, we're aging and dying. The next one is skill set. Say it with me. What? I want you to push that out to you. Well, I want you to think about this. You have to earn the right to lead, to lead in this day and age. Sometimes all of us need an upgrade. We need to look forward. How can we be better? How can we improve? How can we go to the next level? This is about new and better behaviors. As we look at that, we have only so many months left in this year. I got to be willing to raise my personal standards in order to ensure that I am being the best, most committed, most focused, most dedicated, most passionate, most hungry, most driven leader that I can be. We get to do this. We didn't get drafted to do this. We get to do this. And it is an honor and a privilege to be a part of the greatest military in the world. And I don't want to waste no time giving people the best of who I am. Are you with me on this? You, we, we're good. I, I'm already proclaiming. I'm already, you can't clap because I only have so much time. But I want you to understand right now. I want, to, I want you to put this in your mind right now. Whatever is going on, whatever, whatever distractions you have, whatever you are thinking about right now, put in your mind. This is going to be the greatest conference I have ever been because energy follows thought. And I want you to put it there. Anything negative, it, matter of fact, if anybody comes to you today and they want to be negative, they want to complain, Talk about my head shining. You tell them, I don't want to hear that. I want to go forward. I want to be better. I want to grow. And the last thing is tool set. What is that again? I don't know how many of you saw the Avengers, the movie The Avengers, but they have a line in there, and this is what it says. Suit up. I'm telling you right now, it's time to suit up because we're going somewhere because at the end of the day, we want to have a phenomenal experience. I call this the mountaintop experience. So this is the right place right time and we have the right guardsmen. Don't worry about who's not here. Be concerned about who's here right now. Because if we get this right, when we walk out of here, we will have the things, the resources, the attitudes to make our organizations, our nation, our guard what it was born to be. All right, you with me on that? All right, here we go right now. So how's everybody doing? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? All right, so <laughs> I'm in a good mood. I don't know about anybody else. So at this time, it gives me great privilege to introduce for welcoming remarks our leader, the leader of this conference, the chair of the JDAC, the Joint Diversity Executive Council, the adjutant general of the state of Nevada, the one who gave us the privilege, the one who tolerates me, the one <laughs> The one who is our leader and our guest and our host, I want you to give me a rousing, standing welcome as we bring up Brigadier General Bill Burks. Let's give him a great, 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 great round of applause. all of that on no caffeine. It's amazing. <laughs> so he's already stole my first line, but I'll ask it again. How's everybody doing this morning? Great. Okay, great. Um, on behalf of General or uh, Governor Sandoval and myself, welcome to Nevada. It's a great state, um, and I hope everybody is trying to keep it green, so you spend time in the casinos, but not in your uniforms. Um, and if you haven't had that opportunity, there's always tonight after the reception. A um, couple things on Nevada that you probably need to know. It's a very dry state, so make sure you keep hydrated. Uh, how dry is it? Somebody asked me yesterday. Well, yesterday's humidity was 12%. So if you're not used to that, uh, if you're out there jogging, you may not sweat, but you'll find that you have these little salt crystals all over your body. Uh, the other thing is, is if you're out driving around, 
uh, don't be talking on your cell phone because it's what they call a primary offense here. You can be pulled over for it if you're seen talking on your cell phone and driving. Um, contra to not having your seat belt on, which is a secondary offense, they have to pull you over for talking on your cell phone before they can also cite you for your seat belt not being on. So, but in all seriousness, I just want to welcome everyone to this year's National Guard Diversity Conference here in Reno. The goal of this year's conference is to give each and every one of you those innovative tools and education at the executive diversity level and inclusion strategies to take back to your respective states and territories. This will help you build your own diversity inclusion strategies and programs in your state. And one of the things that they kept stressing to me um, before I get into my slides is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, don't forget to introduce Lou Cabrera, but uh, Andre did such a good job. I think, what, what else could you tell about Lou? Well, I've got a few things. <laughs> I'm not sure I can mention them in this crowd, but we'll see. But anyway, um, the Joint Diversity Executive Council was stood up about, what, two years ago? And uh, go ahead and give me the next slide. And there's a little ticker count down here, so I got six minutes and 12 seconds left. Um, so anyway, the Joint Diversity Executive Council is made up of people from all over the United States, all ranks, um, and all walks of life. And so we're going to go over the, the basics on the, the agenda slide here. So give me the next slide, too. Um, this is the purpose and the vision. We're, we're an advisory board, and that's the key word. We're an advisory. We don't have the authority to do anything. But the basic line of what we're really supposed to be trying to do is operationalize diversity with Guard. Not an easy task. Um, we've done a lot of things in the last couple of years, uh, and we're well on our way to that journey, and we'll talk a little bit about those as the conference goes on. The big thing is, is in the vision is to make sure that we have an organizational culture where diversity is valued as part of the personal readiness. What's that mean? When you look at what we have from it's, you hear the numbers 25%, 20%. We can't afford to miss one person because we have artificial ceilings, you know, in place because of diversity issues. We have to remove those artificial barriers, whether they're perceived or real barriers. It doesn't matter to the individual. They happen to be real to them. So that's what we're trying to do. Next slide. This is our mission. We're out there, we will beg, borrow, and steal from any source that we can to figure out what the best practices are out there. And then we take these practices and adapt them to our organization. And then we make the recommendations that we can. I think um, you'll probably see some stats later on that initially we had about 20 organizations out there that uh, had state diversity councils. Um, I think by the end of this year we'll have about 43. That's the kind of progress we're making. And by 2003, we're hopeful that all 54 states and territories will have their own state diversity councils. That's the kind of progress we can make, but we have to keep on this journey. It's a journey, not a destination, and that's part of the mission also. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the kind of the get off the stage slide. It's we've got to have the climate. Each and every one of you are the leaders in your organization. It's up to you to establish that climate that we have. If we, you don't do it, nobody else is. I'll guarantee you, if it's not the leadership that emphasizes this, it'll never get done. It has to go from the top. That's from your adjutant general, down through your various respective component commanders, all the way from the unit commanders, down to the lowest company uh, commander or flight commander on the air side. You have to emphasize effective diversity management at all levels, and you have to your organization is evolving as you go forward on this journey. Next slide. So here's a couple of the uh, things that we've uh, been able to do. We've had, uh, um, like I said, we've got 28 and, uh, out of 54 right now. We're well on our way to uh, getting all 54. Uh, we've, you know, this conference last year and this year and the one before that, uh, we, you've seen these conferences morph a little bit and they're going to continue until we operationalize uh, diversity. And we're going to actually break out into regions based on the Army model. Um, depending on how many regions we have is still to be determined. 
we've got the human uh, goals charter now. The chief put out his diversity policy. I think a lot of you got the uh, information packets with the uh, annual statement in there. It's going to be an annual statement that we keep putting out. And you've also got the little tool, the uh, flip chart. And, you know, that's really about leadership. Uh, also, a serious part of this, uh, some of you have taken place in the last two days. I think the Adjutant General and other general officers in here will take part of the Leadership Challenge Program. Outstanding program. And it weaves diversity into leadership because it is all about leadership. So, in closing, I just want to welcome you all here to Reno. If you have any needs, desires, um, want to know places to eat, make sure you grab some of the people in the white shirts or myself, and we can point you in the right direction. Uh, the Atlantis here is a fabulous facility. Uh, enjoy it. And enjoy Reno. Lake Tahoe is about 45 minutes away. And uh, with that, I'll tell a Lou story. Because <laughs> I have to introduce him, right? OK. And Andre said Lou comes from Nevada. Not originally, but uh, Nevada is his home and always will be. And when you talk about Lou, he had a great career until he made one fatal flaw. He was the only Army colonel that has ever served on the Air Force QDR team. And despite that flaw in his career, he's managed to somehow resurrect his career and become the Guard Bureau Comptroller and Director of Administration Management title, isn't it? For a guy, what you really need to know is he's the money guy. Um, and he's done an exceptional job. I mean, uh, when you look at uh, what's going on with the Guard Bureau, um, not, it's not just the Guard Bureau, it's the entire Pentagon. Uh, he's probably got the toughest job in Washington, D.C., as he tries to get the big army not to eat the, the Army Guard and the Air Force not to eat the, eat the Air National Guard, which uh, we're still fighting on that one. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the best golfer in this room up here to the uh, um, stand for his remarks. Lou? Thank you very much. Let me say first, it is very, very good to be back in Nevada. And I can breathe again with this nice, cool, crisp air, and it's nice and thin, and it's just good to be back. I need one story. I, I won't tell it on uh, Bill, but uh, I, I will say that uh, Bill's one of those few guys that uh, there's a special ring in the cockpit of, uh, of jets that you pull only in the worst of cases. And uh, Bill got the opportunity to uh, pull that ring when an F-4 was coming in one time and they had engine problems and when they thought it would be turning off on their uh, uh, their landing, it decided to go to afterburner and they were already down on the ground and uh, they went left and they went out in the field and they were gathering speed so Bill decided to pop the ring and he did it for the pilot and himself and they both went up in the air and I, and I remember the, the biggest the biggest comment, and I know the pilot well, a guy named Ron Bath, he kept telling Bill, I said, Bud Light, I said, Bud Light. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, but Bill's one of those guys that survived one of those uh, ejections, and he did it at ground level, and there aren't too many people who do that. And uh, Bill, we're glad to have you here, and I'm glad that you're still here, and one of those guys that do it very, very well. Thank you for hosting this conference, General Academy. Thank you for taking your time, and I certainly want to uh, pay recognition to the tags. Uh, very, very important statement that you're here and that uh, you are participating in this event. I also want to draw attention, uh, the, the crowd here is just fantastic. Last year we were in Boston, I'm going to say maybe half of that or so, but most important what I'm really noticing is the inclusion of, or rather the mixture of air Army this time. I have to give great, great uh, kudos to the Army. They ran one of these conferences for past several years, and the National Guard Bureau did not. And uh, I'm going to recall the story here for you in a second with General McKinley and the MLDC, but from a few years ago where there was this conference didn't exist 
to today with 400 attendees in a very, very good composition of Army and Air and senior leaders. I think not only does that uh, reflect well upon the National Guard, the National Guard Bureau, and the JDIC, but it reflects well upon all of you for your participation and your care, and I think that's outstanding. Let me, let me give a little history here because it all began in, in 2009, September 2009, when General McKinley and I accompanied him. He had to uh, provide testimony to the Mi uh, Military Leadership Diversity uh, Committee uh, headed by General Les Lyles. And he uh, went to a hotel room, it was over in Crystal City, and uh, there was about 21 members, I think, of the MLDC, and he was asked several questions about the National Guard, most of which he couldn't answer most of which was related to how is the Guard doing, what is the Guard doing, give us some specifics related to diversity representation in your senior ranks, your GO ranks, your senior enlisted ranks. Give us the numbers and words on what you've done and what your plan is and what your program is. All of those questions General McKinley could not, could not answer. It was not uh, what I would call uh, a moment of excellence, and certainly I've had the opportunity many, many times to obj observe General McKinley, and I've had the opportunity many times to uh, listen to him give what I would call leadership guidance after one of those moments, and believe me, I got quite a bit of leadership guidance right after the meeting. As a consequence, uh, within just a couple of months, in late 2009, we wrote a charter for the JDIC, and in the early 2010, we created the JDIC, and uh, Bill uh, volunteered to be the chairman. We had a couple of meetings, and I want to tell you that the accomplishments of the JDIC since then have been absolutely remarkable and something to be proud of. And I'll, I'll uh, go over a couple of those, but then I want to recall the story that occurred to me up on the hill just about three weeks ago. Uh, we also created a new Office of Diversity. We've hosted the first diversity conference in January. The next one will be 24 July. By the way, that will be, uh, I'll say, co-hosted, but at least participated. Uh, uh, General Les Lyles, who was the guy asking General McKinley questions, he was more than happy and honored to participate in our, virtual, our next virtual diversity conference. I want to tell you something. The National Guard was the first ever to do one. Army Air, the big Army, big Air, the services, the Navy, the Marine Corps, all called us and said, what a concept. It was remarkable. We set, we, we broke barriers that most people didn't even know existed. They published a leader's guide. Most of you have them in your packet. I need to tell you, I went to, uh, about three weeks ago, I testified to what's called the tri -caucus. Uh That is the black, the Asian Pacific, and the Hispanic caucus at Congress, and I, I had to testify. Well, I didn't testify. It was, a, it was a discussion. And I brought out this leader's guide, and I showed it to them, and I also talked about our partnership with Diomi. I talked about our, our, our state councils. I talked about the leadership challenge training or program, which the TAGs are going to participate. It was very, 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 very interesting because two days later, we got a call. Actually, Phyllis got a call saying from the Air Force guy, said, what did you guys do? The, the Tri-Caucus people were handing us the leader's guide and said, what have you guys done like this? And we are the example right now. We're setting the trail or establishing the trail, and I just think, number one, that's related to the support you get from General McKinley. And by the way, about three weeks ago, uh, he got tired of, uh, of some of the being around, so we just gave another million dollars to the JDIC just to buy stuff that you see in your desk, and we just continue to push this money with uh, an intent that you will be successful. Not very much more money, Bill, so you have to spend it wisely. But I want to tell you, when you need it, General McKinley's there, and we give you the money that you need. Uh, a couple of things to come, which are important, these demographic reports we've been working on. Uh, again, we could not tell you how many GOs what would the representation was in the GO community nationwide. It goes a little bit to our structure, but now we can. You'll be seeing an annual, the first ever annual diversity report in the National Guard world. I've seen the first cut of print. Uh, you'll see a strategic plan. You'll see the diversity guides. And then um, finally, here's a very, very, very important part. Tomorrow, you'll hear from General McKinley. He'll be talking about his transition and his moving on to a new, new chief. Uh, I think what's important is that 
what's happened now is that you have established the momentum and the next chief I think will be not only proud but will be surprised at the progress that the National Guard Bureau has made in the past couple of years and frankly I'm, I'm very proud to be part of that. Let me just say one final thing and it's related to a, con a con uh, conversation I had with Jim Gorham last night and I think it's an important point. You as leaders have a requirement to pull someone up next to you and say, you're by my side and I want you to be there. No one else does it. I especially point to the adjutant generals. You've got to pull people up. That's the way it's going to happen. With that, thank you, welcome. It's an outstanding opportunity and I am very, very proud and happy to be back in Reno. Thank you. to call somebody up next. Uh, so I believe it's Chief, but yeah, here we come. All right, so just imagine I'm Mr. Cabrera. I'm not as good looking, but uh, just imagine I'm Mr. Cabrera and I call up our next, next speaker here. So let's give the Chief a big hand, big hand. Good morning. Major General Academy, General Officers, Senior Leaders of the National Guard. What an honor this is to address a group of professionals who are committed to transforming the National Guard into an organization where diversity and inclusion are common practice. Collectively, this audience is responsible for shaping this organization that embraces the full spectrum of experiences, viewpoints, and beliefs, and one that challenges each soldier and airmen to grow and think differently. Congratulations. When informed that I would be speaking to the seasoned professionals, the equal opportunity practitioners on the Warrant Officer Corps, as it relates to diversity, I wasn't quite sure where to begin. As this group fully understands, diversity is a comprehensive and covers a plethora of differences among individuals. Differences that can be measured with your eyes, such as race, ethnicity, color, and age, and those differences not visible or recognized until peeling back the onion, looking beyond the surface, and discovering the talents, the beliefs, ideas, and characteristics of each individual represented in our organization. Let me begin speaking to an area where we have been successful and one where we have reached, received many accolades from the senior leaders. Slide, please. This picture was recently taken of your Command Chief Warrant Officers two weeks ago in St. Louis. This group of command chiefs represents the warrant officers assigned to the states and territories in the District of Columbia. This team of command chiefs and leaders of the Warrant Officer Corps epitomize the concept of diversity and inclusion. Of the 54 command chiefs appointed by the adjutants generals, not all photographed here, uh, represent 38% of the underrepresented populations or females. Further, this group comprises, comprises of warrant officers representing all military branches and various educational disciplines and comprehensive lists of experiences, skills, and traits pulled from both the public and private sector and the respective regions. This is the leadership of the Warrant Officer Corps. They are the leaders that will strive to reach the desired end state of achieving the Warrant Officer Corps representatives of the community serving as the National Guard and one that, is, that has the skill sets aligned to the objectives and the mission of the Army National Guard. Your command chiefs are fully aware that when comparing the, the represent, representational uh, diversity of the National Guard, the Warrant Officer Corps percentages are not aligned with the percentages reported by the Bureau of Census. At the national level, there have been improvements that further 
uh, that further commitment is in order to achieve a truly diverse warrant officer corps. Further analysis review is needed at the state level and where necessary and possible, we expect to see an increase in the percentages of the underutilized populations. Moving forward, each command chief will be challenged to tap the existing pool of qualified non-commissioned officers. The significant factor in this process is the soldier. Do these seasoned soldiers in underrepresented populations who possess the leadership skills, technical prowess, military bearing, want to become warrant officers? The warrant officers will continue to grow and recruit in ranks of the Army National Guard. Of the 74 warrant officer MOSs, only one is close to women. That MOS is the Special Forces, the 180 Alphas. We will select and groom the best of the best within the ranks of the Army National Guard, while simultaneously uh, changing the diversity within the ranks to align with the mission and the objectives of the National Guard. This is the one of this is one of the cornerstones of diverse programs. To cultivate the workforce already on board and promote from within, the Warrant Officer Corps gives new meaning to succession planning. Our first opportunity is to continue to balance the force comes through advertising, getting the word out to the soldiers, and encouraging all who are qualified to apply. But how do you know that a soldier wants to become a Warrant Officer? Mentorship. Mentorship is the way leaders at all echelons learn the true character of a soldier. We are encouraging and will continue to encourage existing warrant officers and officers to continue the, uh, to discuss with the NCOs to ensure that these NCOs know what the warrant officer is and how the warrant officer benefits the mission and the unit readiness. As we all mentor our enlisted force, we must first hone on the sharpest soldiers need some urging to be the best that they can be, to become the warrant officers of the 21st century, a leader, an advisor, and a tactical technical expert. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Command Sergeant Major Birch, the Command Sergeant Major of the Army National Guard, and he told me that he had a conversation with his state command chief warrant officer uh, and about recruiting, and the, the, the discussion was about record, recruiting the warrant officers from the NCO Corps, and he simply said, continue to recruit from the NCO Corps until I tell you to stop. He did not. Today, Nebraska has one of the highest percentages of fill of all the warrant officers in the, in the nation. What a, what, what a powerful statement. Think about this. Uh, to have the understanding of the best and the brightest of your force is being recruited from your ranks. What is more encouraging is that the Sergeant of the Army National Guard understands that we are all in this together. We're not losing the NCO. The organization is providing the soldier an opportunity that they are not otherwise may have not had. Everyone has the opportunity, but one has to seize it. In closing, I'm confident by, the t by this time next year, the Warrant Officer Corps will have to further successful stories in speaking at the higher levels of achievement with the continued commitment to an inclusive environment and one that fosters dignity and respect, coupled with the combat branches and the MOSs being available to women, where there is room only for greater levels of success in the areas of diversity and inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for everything that you do and your continued efforts, no matter how small or large, in making the NCO, uh, I'm sorry, making the National Guard the golden standard of diversity and inclusive, or inclusive organizations. I have to introduce now uh, the senior listed leader to the chief of the National Guard Bureau and one of my best battle buddies, Chief uh, Denise uh, Jelinski Hall. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Oh, so much better. Thank you. Good morning. On behalf of General Craig McKinley, it is my distinct privilege to welcome you to the National Guard Bureau Joint Diversity Conference. Our theme for this conference, in pursuit of greatness through diversity, leadership development to implement and operationalize diversity. 
This is a topic that is very important to General McKinley, the National Guard Bureau mission now and in the future. Diversity is a strategic imperative for the National Guard and for our nation. As such, it will help us shape the force for generations to come. Diversity is woven into everything we do. It's important to our soldiers, airmen, civilians, and it's important to our nation. Now here's a critical point. Diversity must be leader-led, leader-focused, and must be a shared leadership priority for everyone. I'm extremely confident we will all be successful because the National Guard has the best leaders throughout the country. We are experiencing ever-changing mission and emerging mission support, both at home and abroad. Diversity is essential in developing, implementing, and maintaining strategic diversity processes for the organization's success. We are representative of the diverse opinions, abilities, beliefs, ideologies, and experiences of our greater American society. The success of the National Guard depends on the contributions of every man and woman who have volunteered to join our force. At the NGB level, the work, recommendations, and resources developed by the Joint Diversity Executive Council are vital to our mission. National Guard leaders around the country need strategies, tools, like the Leader's Guide, and timely information to, effect, to effectively lead their soldiers, airmen, and civilians. I'm confident that the diversity tools we have developed will equip all of us to instill the principles of diversity in our daily lives and in our National Guard culture. This I can assure you. There is a rock-solid commitment to keep diversity on the forefront as a leadership priority. Diversity and inclusion, inclusion maximizes our potential and strengthens the total force. Inclusion is a major factor when we examine sexual assaults, suicide, hazing, and other challenging situations. Every member of the National Guard needs to be engaged and needs to feel respected, included, and valued, like they're really part of something special. It's important to employ diversity education and training to provide leaders the skills needed to manage and capitalize on a diverse workforce. Inclusion strategies such as mentorship, developmental counseling, and clear policy guidance are keys to the health of the force. As leaders, we must optimize the ability of National Guard members and civilians to make informed career choices from accession to retirement with special emphasis on professional development for those entrusted in our care. We have a highly educated force that possesses military and civilian skill sets, making our people extremely valuable. We must work harder to track regional, cultural, and language experience in military and civilian workforce demographics. Equally important is to ensure transparency through visibility of data and workforce demographics. Military experience among members of Congress is dwindling. It's members of the National Guard who will keep America connected to our military. Army and Air National Guard community outreach and community relations to nationwide affinity group conferences will become more and more important. National Guard members participate in 75% of total events per year the largest percentage in comparison to the United States Air Force and Air Force Reserve. We must capitalize on building relationships and strengthening stakeholder engagement through DOMI, the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute. As an example, leadership should focus on new census bureau information, our nation's changing demographics, eligible workforce, and societal challenges will impact how we attract, recruit, retain, and develop soldiers and airmen for future missions. It's important that the National Guard is reflective of our nation at all levels and all ranks. Every soldier and airman, officer and enlisted, should be able to look at their career path and see themselves at the top. 
The real strength of the National Guard is found in its people and in capitalizing and appreciating our differences. Training, recruiting, and retaining our National Guard members is key to the success of our mission. Our soldiers and airmen have proven themselves repeatedly in combat, humanitarian, and domestic response missions. They consistently meet the many challenges asked of them. The National Guard may be primarily a part-time force, but, it, but when disaster strikes, they are full-time heroes in the communities in which they serve. Our forces should mirror our communities and embrace the richness of their diversity. This will allow more Americans to see military service as a viable choice and will build even stronger trust with the American people. Nothing is more urgent and important to the future of the National Guard. Diversity is essential to mission success. In closing, diversity encompasses acceptance and respect. It means understanding that each individual is unique and recognizes our individual differences. It's about understanding and embracing the rich dimensions of diversity contained within each individual. Thank you for your service and for your leadership. May God bless you, your families, and may he continue to bless the United States of America. And now back to Colonel Barry. Thank you. <laughs> That's our chief. She keeps us straight. But I want to thank all of our speakers this morning, uh, General Burks, Mr. Cabrera, Chief Nisker, Chief Kielinski Hall. Thank you for your comments this morning. I hope uh, that you have captured and written down what the leadership is saying as we go forward with diversity. We will have our first break this morning. I'm going to ask that you be promptly back in your seats by 0915. This is our first break. Please be back in your seats, 0915. Thank you. <laughs>